regional anesthesia by Dr. Ashwin Mohan. So let's first review the history of ophthalmic anesthesia. In the year 600 BC, Sushruta practiced inhalational anesthesia, which is the first form of local anesthesia. Later on, the Egyptians they practiced carotid compression, which in a way led to decreased blood flow to the brain and it caused decreased pain sensation. Well, the real anesthesia started off in the year 1880 where carbonic acid, chloroform and nitrous oxide were used as forms of anesthesia. Ether was first described by Faraday in the year 1918-80. Later on, Neiman discovered cocaine by tasting it on his tongue in the year 1860-80. In the year 1884, Mr. Carl Collar, he described the anesthetic effect of cocaine and used it for cataract surgery in a topical form. In the same year, Knapp and Turnbull, they used a cocaine for an enucleation procedure where they used the topical and the subtenance anesthesia. Now you see that in the year 1904, Einhorn, um, he, he, he discovered procaine hydrochloride and the use of epinephrine as a vasoconstrictor. But in, in the last 20 years, from 1884 to 1904, the use of cocaine fell into dispute because of the many adverse effects of cocaine. A few of the adverse effects of cocaine will, well, it decreased the blood flow. It, it, it acted like an immense vasoconstrictor, which really decreased the blood flow to the ocular structures. And it, it also, when, well, when it was used topically, it also caused a lot of corneal toxicity. So it fell into dispute, both because of the local and the systemic side effects it took of uh, cocaine. Um, in the year 1914, Fan Lind, he used. Uh, he, he first described orbicularis echinacea. In the year 1929, O'Brien, and in the year 1943, Lovren and Lundquist, they discovered lignocaine. Now, the retrobulb block was first described by Atkinson in the year 1955 AD. Moving ahead, the peribulbar anesthesia was, discover, was described by Davis in the year 1985. In 1990, well, we should know that almost after 100 years, subtenance anesthesia returned back in vogue and was described by Hansen. And topical anesthesia, which is used frequently today in most of uh, the advanced cataract surgical centers, um, they used tetracaine topically in the year 1992, which was described by Fitchman. And in the year 2010 AD, I'm presenting on regional anesthesia. Mm. Uh, Contraindications. Why would you want to know the contraindications at the beginning of a presentation? Yes, because you will want to know what are the conditions where you would just not proceed with this process. So the absolute contraindications, the infants and the demented, the uncooperative patient, the psychiatric patient, any infection in that area, there's a risk of, uh, of penetrating the structure and spreading the infection. Or vital wall fractures, yes, your needle can enter into in the places which are fractured and cause further damage and predictably prolonged surgeries you're better off giving a general anesthesia as compared to a local anesthesia the relative uh, contraindications any coagulation abnormality well i mean if you were to puncture a vessel which would bleed and would would deal to would lead to sorry a retrobulbar hemorrhage with the coagulation of normality it become, well, become very difficult to control uh, the hemorrhage. Anatomical factors like very deep set eyes or high myopia. In patients who are hard of hearing and language barriers, you better are giving them a general anesthesia. Uh, more patients with persistent cough, which will increase the pressure, which will also increase the risk of expulsive hemorrhage, so you're probably better off giving a general anesthesia. Lung disorders of thopnea and skeletal deformities in, in all these cases. You're probably better off giving a general anesthesia to the patient. Well, the surgical spaces of the orbit. Read below the important line anatomy determines effect, which has been quoted from Duane's ophthalmology, which means that every patient has an anatomy that is unique to his to his body. And hence it's very difficult to predict the effectiveness of the anesthesia. Few 
of the anesthetic uh, blocks that we give might be successful and a few might fail just because of the peculiar anatomy of the patient. So, uh, but before we block, we should, we should aim at success, but we can never be assured that the block is going to be 100% certain and 100% effective. Now, uh, going on to the most uh, peripheral space is the subperiosteal space, which is um, the space between the bone and the subperiosteal. Um, we don't really use the space in, in local anesthesia. Uh, the peribulbar space, which is used probably most frequently for the cataract surgeries, is the space between the cone of the muscles and the periosteum. The intracone space is the space which is formed behind the globe and inside the cone of the muscles. And the subtenin space is the space which is present between the tenon's capsule and the sclera. Well, sensory innovation. But what is important here to know is that the lacrimal nerve and uh, the frontal nerve they come out um, slightly superiorly in that they do not lie within the annulus of Zen, which means that they are not intracone structures but they are extracone structures. Whereas the uh, nasociliary nerve comes out from within the annulus of Zen, and um, the ciliary ganglion that we see here, which is not labeled uh, but there is an almond shaped structure there. That is present within the cone. So when we give a retrobulbar block, we're really blocking the ciliary ganglion very effectively. But it will not be very effective in blocking the lacrimal and the frontal nerve, which means that uh, conjunctival anesthesia and later kinesia would not really occur with a retrobulbar block. Um, yes. Um, right. Now, the facial planes of the orbit. I put this diagram up to not to really show you any specific plane of the orbit, but just to show you how the orbit is divided into planes in, in, in this fashion into pockets. And um, the tip of the needle might be present in any one of these pockets. It could be present in a large pocket, it could be present in, in one of the small pockets. And if it's present in one of the small pockets, most of the injection is, is going to take a longer time to spread. Well, we all use. Um, an enzyme called hyaluronidase mostly in our blocks which um, which further helps to break down these tissue barriers and spread across um, the space but if the if the tip of the needle is present in 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 one of these spaces it's going to take a long time to spread yes. structures we pierce in the eyelid but it's important for us to know what the structures we pierce on our way um, in into the orbit so when we get the inferior block, we are essentially uh, piercing the skin, the superficial fat, uh, the orbicularis muscle, and uh, the orbital septum. Uh, we always pierce the eyelid inferior to the tarsal plate and superior to the tarsal plate, uh, depending on which block we are given. So we never really go through the tarsal plate. We always go through the orbital septum, and then we just land up in the orbital vital fat. And um, another important thing is when we go superiorly, we, um, we should be a little careful about the levator, uh, levator palpable superioris, which is present superiorly. So the type of blocks that we're going to discuss um, in this presentation are the retrobulbar block, the peribulbar block, the subtenons, the subconjunctival, the lid and the facial block, and the intracameral um, block. Is the common drugs used uh, for anesthesia, lignocaine, which is used as 2%, uh, bupivacaine is, is another commonly used drug, uh, which is used in a concentration of 0.5%, lepivacaine and etidocaine, they deserve mention here, although we don't really use them frequently. Alright, so how do these drugs act? Well, we all know they act on the nerves. They block um, the pain sensation in some way. Um, but it's important to remember here that we don't only block sensory, but we also block uh, motor. So, sodium channels, the fast voltage gated sodium channels are blocked. As a result, the membrane will not depolarize, be it any nerve, be it an afferent nerve or an efferent nerve, and the nerve fails to transmit the action potential. Okay? So, um, the sensory nerves are the uh, smallest in diameter of the nerves, whereas uh, the motor nerves are larger in diameter. So, 
Um, now we're going to see a loss of sensory action first, and then we're going to see a loss of motor action. And um, the reverse is true when the anesthesia beams off. So we see a return of the motor activity first, and then a return of the sensory activity. Right? So what are the adjuvants we use uh, in, in local anesthesia? Epinephrine. It constricts uh, the blood vessels, and it, it prolongs the stay of the anesthetic in, in the tissue. It, it slows down the clearing of the anesthetic agent from the tissue space. Hyaluronidase, days, as already described previously in facial planes, uh, that would have given us an understanding of, of what it does. And sodium bicarbonate, uh, what it does is it, it increases the pH. Right, now a concept here to remember is that the anesthetic agent is, um, well, it needs to be in the ionized state for it to act. And um, at a lower pH, it's, um, well, I mean, if the pH is higher, less concentration of the anesthetic will be in the ionized state. More concentration will be in the non-ionized precipitated form of, uh, well, in, in that state. So it, it that way, um, keeps less of the anesthetic agent in the ionized state and it, uh, it releases, you could say, the anesthetic agent slowly so it prolongs the action of the anesthetic I, ho well, I hope this concept is clear and i hope i'm clear in explaining this concept to you uh, moving on the needles that are used a few important things that we should remember about the needle is the gauge now bigger the number thinner the needle yeah. uh, so um, a 26 gauge needle is going to be thinner than a 23 gauge needle and a 30 gauge needle is going to be the thinnest so for the parabolic anesthesia we use um, a 23 gauge needle which is about one inch long a metallic needle now um, these needles they have a hub and and the needle part of it so um, generally this this hub is present to stop the needle from advancing and and it, and it also tells us uh, to what extent the needle, uh, well the tip of the needle has has advanced into the orbit um, sharp versus blunt well sharp has an advantage over blunt in that it causes less tissue distortion and it causes less pain as a result of the less tissue of, of the less tissue distortion. Um, but also since it decreases the resistance of it to the forward propulsion of the needle um, or the forward advancement of the needle, if we were to pierce the globe, um, we would probably not know when we do that because it offers less resistance. The blunt needle on the other hand is going to cause more pain, it's going to cause more trauma, but it's somewhere um, is going to offer a lot more resistance when we um, are close to the sclera, and hence it might just prevent us from accidentally causing a glow perforation. Well, and there's a video of uh, retrobulb anesthesia on, on the technique of uh, retrobulb anesthesia. Well, at the junction of the lateral one third and the medial two thirds, inferiorly we advance initially parallel to the floor of the orbit and then bend it into the retrobulbar space, and the anesthetic agent is injected into the space behind the globe and inside the cone, which is the intraconal retrobulbar space. And generally, about 4 ml, 3 to 5 ml, is, is going to be adequate to cause complete intraocular anesthesia, and I'm, I'm going to also rest most of the intraocular. Uh, sorry, uh, well, the extra muscle movements. Well, um, another important thing is uh, when we did look at the um, innovation, we saw that the frontal nerve and the lacrimal nerve, which are the sensory nerves, they come out outside the analysis of zinc. What was but what was not shown in the diagram is that the trochlear nerve also comes out outside the analysis of zinc. So, what this means is, um, well, the trochlear nerve supplies the superior oblique. So, a classic sign will be an intorsion sign if we're giving a 